We're going to meet Joe Kent, a congressional candidate in the state of Washington, a former Green Beret who served for more than 20 years, including 11 combat deployments. In the midst of continual combat, I met and married my soulmate, Shannon Kent, a fellow warrior and special operator. Shannon blessed me with two sons and a loving family life. I plan to continue to serve our nation abroad, fighting our enemies overseas, until the 16th of January, 2019, when Shannon was killed fighting ISIS in Mandich, Syria. It's quite a story. Few people in this country understand so personally the devastation caused by the endless wars of our government uh, that they insist that we continue to fight uh, better than this man. His wife, as you just heard, Shannon, was killed about one month after President Trump attempted to pull the U.S. out of Syria, a decision, if you recall, that had the swamp in Washington, D.C., up in arms. And Joe Kent is running for Congress to take on the very people who sit comfortably there, championing these unwinnable conflicts. And he joins us uh, tonight to talk about all this. And, sir, thank you so much for taking the time. So much for having me on. So you, you say you're sick of watching the government lie about regime change wars uh, like the ones you were sent to fight. Tell us a little bit more uh, about this anger inside you. And so I've served for over 20 years. It was the greatest uh, honor of my life to go forward and fight for this country. Yeah. That's how me and all my friends who volunteered to go fight these wars we felt, but then we also saw the fact that our government, regardless of who was in power, uh, had no issues with keeping us at war in conflicts that were of no gain to the United States. We went to war for all the right reasons to go take out al-Qaeda, but we quickly deviated after that into these wars of regime change and nation building that actually never resulted in any clear success for the United States or anything that our country actually needed. But I did see the political class, our unelected bureau bureaucratic class, the permanent ruling class of our nation continue to benefit from these wars. That was until President Trump came on on the scene. He realized that we had to defeat ISIS so they couldn't pose a threat to the rest of the world. But then he tried to get our troops out once we defeated the territorial caliphate. Right after that, we saw what happened. Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis and a bunch of other unelected bureaucrats from the, the permanent ruling class turned against President Trump, tried to portray that he didn't know what he was doing, that he was incompetent. Yeah. And that resulted in our troops staying there and my wife getting killed a month after he tried to get them out, thanks to bureaucratic slow roll and the will of the American people being rejected. That's unbelievable. And, and when you when they talk about this, uh, sir, you know, they, they always you hear the same people say the same thing. It's like, OK, let's get out of Afghanistan. Well, they say, oh, you're going to create this vacuum and then we're going to have it. We're going to have another terrorist attack because we're not keeping an eye on that area. How do you respond to, to that retort? Yeah, it's just binary thinking. Um, so the, the permanent military industrial complex and the intelligence community has really sold this false choice that we either have to be in a state of perpetual war, perpetual nation building, perpetually propping up these failed regimes or these failed governments, or we have to pull out everyone and we will immediately be attacked by terrorists. That That's just patently false. We have other options. These wars of occupation and regime change have actually gotten us nothing. However, we have the ability within our special operations community and within our intelligence community to do limited counterterrorism strikes as needed and then through our intelligence community to monitor things overseas and to be able to give us foresight into what's happening in that region. The whole part where we stay at war with this massive machinery, there's a huge financial incentive and then also a huge amount of ego behind that because so many in our defense establishment have made their careers off these wars. So we have to really get out of this mentality that's a binary choice between constant war and occupation or complete and total isolation. We have other options and we have a very robust network in our government that can provide those options to the American people. You say it. You say it really well, the way you put that together. That, that makes perfect sense, the way you put that together. Um, w when you lost your wife uh, fighting ISIS, um, you made the decision to come back home. Uh, get out of combat, come back, raise your sons. There's a picture of your wife, Shannon, there. Uh, returning from a war zone to your childhood home, which is the Portland, Oregon area, uh, which, sad to say, is one of the worst places in the country in a lot of ways right now. The, the homicide rate in Portland, Oregon, is up a staggering 800%. It's, it's hands down, far and away, the worst in the country as far as the increase from last year. And you've also got an Antifa element in that city that just will not quit, probably the worst in the country as well. Tell us what else you're seeing, because you're running for Congress, as I understand it, in Washington, but your district will butt right up against Portland, right there on the river uh, where Portland sits, right across. 
That's right. So Washington State's third congressional district, that's where I am. Uh, our major urban hub, Vancouver, is essentially a suburb of Portland. Uh, many people have family in Portland or, or work in Portland. So what happens in Portland very much affects us. And then to our north, we're kind of squeezed. We have Seattle to our north and Olympia to our north. So we have these hotbeds of lawlessness um, from Antifa, BLM, and the far left, and really just incompetent governance. We have mayors and district attorneys in these cities that refuse to deal with the violence on their streets. So this has really bled over into our communities. We've had elected officials just completely and totally shirk their duties, to include the woman that I'm going after, Jamie Herrera Butler. She was completely silent as Antifa marched into, into our district, into Vancouver from Portland, and started to vandalize local businesses and attack citizens. She refused to say anything until it was time to cross the aisle and vote with the Democrats to take away President Trump's ability to deploy U.S. troops and the National Guard to go and quell the violence in her district. So the people here, we're just fed up with that. We've seen time and time again what happens when Portland decays. We have homelessness. We have drug trafficking, human trafficking. We have anarchy spilling over from Portland, spilling over from Seattle and Olympia. And then we have elected officials like our our governor, uh, Jay Inslee, he won't do anything about that. The governor to our south, Kate Brown, they won't do anything about that. So we've just had a whole total leadership failure that people are suffering from feckless. right now in this district. Absolutely feckless. It, it is embarrassing to see the way Seattle as well, Seattle and Portland, uh, the northwest yeah. of this country, is just shameful uh, the way they've tried to handle the situation. Watching Antifa do this every day, trying to burn down federal buildings. I mean, how do yeah. we let this go on? It's, it's humiliating. Joe Kent, uh, you've got a lot of work ahead of you because um, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be fixed. Uh, we wish you luck, and thank you so much for coming on the show. We'll follow the race. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Of course.